Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome Simon Michaud. He is a, an associate professor of geometallurgy at the Geological Survey of Finland. Simon, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Hello, Robert. It's very nice to meet you in, uh, in on the podcast. So uh, I warned you before, uh, you um, are... Uh, and, and you're required on this podcast to introduce yourself. And so imagine you've arrived somewhere, you don't know anyone, uh, and you have about 60 seconds. Go. Okay. So I was educated in Australia, basic degree of physics and geology. I joined the mining industry uh, in research and development, and I did a PhD in mining engineering. So I've had formal training in physics, geology, and mining engineering. Um, experience has been open pit optimization, uh, geostatistics, rock breakage, blasting, flotation, leaching, and then geometallurgy. I then left Australia and came to Europe to learn industrial recycling, and I found the circular economy uh, when I was in Belgium. And I left Belgium to come to Finland, where I joined the Mineral Intelligence Project to track uh, data, uh, uh, data patterns in industry. And now I'm attached to the Circular Economy Solutions unit that uh, has a five ton an hour pilot plant. In, and you live in Helsinki now? Yes, uh, technically Espo, which is in uh, you know twenty minutes from the center of Helsinki. Gotcha. But you're That's an Aussie, you're an Aussie by birth. Where are you from in Australia? In Brisbane, East uh -huh. Coast. Oh yes, the Sunshine Coast, beautiful place. I've been there only once or twice, but uh, amazing. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, good. So uh, let's jump right in. Uh, you are the author of a one thousand page report titled "Assessment of the Extra Capacity Required of Alternative Energy Electrical Power Systems to Completely Replace Fossil Fuels." It's a mouthful, uh, but it's a, a, a very uh, comprehensive report on uh, the amount of minerals, metals uh, that would be required to move to alternative energy. Can you give us, uh, uh, you know, this is this is a podcast. We don't have two or three hours. We have an hour. Yeah. Give us the brief uh, summary then, if you could, of this 1000 page report. We, we hear a lot about alternative energy that we're going to change the entire economy, quit using hydrocarbons. Uh, what did you what? Did you, how do you summarize this uh, mammoth paper that you produced? So this is actually part of a six report series. So as large as it is, it's part of a series. Uh, five of those reports are on the ground now. So <clears throat> the purpose here was to um, put the logistics, the physical requirements of if we were to fa phase out fossil fuels and apply the plan as our policymakers in the European Commission believe they're going to apply it, what will it look like? And what that part is, they, they assume the existing system around us will be replaced, like fully replaced, and we'll have all the same activities happening. What would be the physical requirements be? What would it look like? How many solar panels? How many wind turbines? How many power stations? How many electric vehicles? How many batteries? And of what kind? So that was the first half of the work. The second half of the work was to, okay, now that we know how many units, what metals would we need to produce the first generation of non-fossil fuels right and so and, and that's that's the second report uh, uh, it, it's actually being published now there's been a few presentations around it and it's now going into a peer-reviewed journal so so uh the purpose of this was uh to address what i saw when i first came to europe that our future was being dictated by our strategic policy leaders you know the civil senior civil servants of the european commission and the european union um around what they called the circular economy and what they were dictating for the future and there was no details they had a vision with some vague platitudes but they had no okay now what there was there was no uh, there was no big plan for industrial reform there's, there's there's no feasibility study uh assessment of to actually sort of move forward and do this the basic so there were, so there were a lot of there. assumptions about what could yeah. happen, but no deep dive into what had to happen in yeah. terms of that that shift to, for the energy transition, right? Which is the popular phrase now that is being used for this. Yeah. Actually, I say it this way: it's not what could happen. They were talking about things that were have already happened, or this is what we are going to do, right? They, right. they were talking in terms of this is the way things will be, right? No, there, there was no choice about what we might or might not do. 
but instead kind of this yeah. command idea of, well, this is the way we think yeah. it should, should be, and therefore it will be. But I want to read this section, which is the summary of the full report, which I think summarizes it pretty well. You said current expectations are that global industrial businesses will replace a complex industrial energy ecosystem that took more than a century to build. The current system was built with the support of the highest. This is the part that I think find is really on point was built with the high with the support of the highest calorifically dense source of energy the world has ever known oil in cheap, abundant quantities with easily available credit and seemingly unlimited mineral resources. The replacement needs to be done when there is comparatively very expensive energy, a fragile finance system saturated in debt, not enough minerals, and an unprecedented world population embedded in a deteriorating natural environment. Most challenging of all, this has to be done within a few decades. This is where you come in, you say, it is the author's opinion based on the new calculations presented here that this will likely not go fully at to as planned. There's your understatement <laughs> of, the, of the report. In conclusion, this report suggests that replacing the existing fossil fuel powered system, oil, gas and coal using renewable technology such as solar panels or wind turbines will not be possible for the entire global human population. There is simply just not enough time nor resources to do this by the current target set by the world's most influential nations. I mean, that's a that's a, a, a you know, I think a great summary. But let me just cut to the chase Then, if you, you, you've you looked at all these different commodities, all these different minerals from copper, uh, oil, etc. Is there one commodity then that uh, there's been a lot of focus on copper The you know, the traders call it Dr. Copper as the indicator for the global economy. Is it copper, cobalt, neodymium? Are these the we've heard there's a lot about I can, we can talk about rare earth elements. Is there one commodity or two or three that you can put your finger on and say, this is the real hang on hanger hang up right mm -hmm. here that this one is going to be the real one the one that's most problem problematic or most challenging. Yes. So uh, a lot of that report focuses on the lithium ion battery chemistries. Right. But and, and I've shown this that that's probably not going to work the way we think because we don't have the volumes. The simple answer is to make batteries out of something else. Right? And mm. we can do that. What we can't do and this you actually said it already copper. We can't electrify the world without copper. You can substitute copper with aluminium in some places, in some applications, but to make aluminium, you need an enormous amount of electricity. And so that puts pressure on a system that is already under pressure. Right. right. So, so I believe copper is the rate determining step, uh, both in the current day to day demand, uh, but also in the world that we think we're going to create. I like that idea, the rate determining step. So it's the, going to be the volume of copper that we that we I'm saying now the global we uh, can produce will be the the will determine the rate at which any electrification can occur. But that is yeah. the, but that but that commodity more than others is is the one. And it will, so let me just take that because one of the things that I thought was really intriguing about your report was. You also talk about the uh, the quality of the ore bodies and the need to pulverize them. I've, I'm not, I don't know if that's the exact correct term, but to f reduce the grain size when you have lower quality ore, you have to you have to you have to uh, process it right. more, and that requires more yeah. energy. That seems to be one of the the key points that you're making here overall about. If you have declining ore quality, which we do, you have to have more energy to pr process that ore. Can you talk about that, please? Yes. Yes. So um, this is to say we're not running out of copper ore. The entire Andes mountain range is one big giant copper deposit. Mm. What we've got is a very low grade ore, we're, um, ore type and, and grade's been decreasing. What we are facing challenges is our ability to extract that copper. Mm. So our ability to produce copper and bring it to markets. So. The mining industry, uh, this is the work in Australia, was, has, is facing a number of technical problems. Now, the mining industry has gone through several phases uh, already and um, uh, of, of business model, and we are evolving into a new phase. And this is before we get to the idea of electrification. So, and we've got problems like decreasing grade, right? We, we've mined out all the good deposits already. Then you've got uh, um, uh, what, what, what you were talking about there is the mineral grinds, uh, mineral grain grind size. So the target mineral we're trying to extract, uh, the the minerals themselves are much smaller in size, and the smaller that is, the more energy we've got to expend to grind the rock down to that level. It's it terms grinding, and so you've got to, uh, and it's an exponential relationship, where the finer you go, the exponentially more energy you need to apply to do that. 
and you've got to grind it all to what's called liberate the metal out of the rock so things like flotation can actually take those metal particles out and concentrate them. So the next problem is the rock itself is because we're going after the dis more disseminated rock types, the rock itself is getting harder, which means you have to make a stronger mill and use more draw power draw to crush and grind the rock. So you've got to, and, and then if we're going to go fine grind with, uh, to a finer level, you have problems with actually you know, using more water, more potable water in, in, in things like grinding and flotation, because you can't recycle the water. The ore is so fine, it suspends in water and you have these big settling ponds, mm. right? And, that, and, and it takes a lot longer to actually settle the actual ore out and reuse that water. So your water consumption is going up. So, so the mining industry is facing a whole series of technical problems as we move into different um, mineralogies that they're mining, right? And, and so our ability to expand, our ability to maintain existing production is getting more and more expensive. Mm. Right, right. Well, so, yeah. If, if, well, if I could follow up on the energy inputs there, because I think this is interesting as well to, to underscore that well, what type of energy is this? So many of these mines, I'm not going to say all of them, but there were in, many of them in very remote locations and they're mm -hmm. using diesel fuel gensets to to for their electricity. Right. So the mm -hmm. we have a trans that uh, the liberating the metals from the rock requires more energy inputs. And that energy in many cases is going to be liquid hydrocarbons. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. And no. Uh, okay. When we actually, the way we like to do it is, is put a gas pipeline out to a remote area because gas apparently is cheap. Right. And then it goes to a power plant and that power plant will power the mine. Right. So yeah. th these processing plants need something like, you know, you know 30, uh, 30 odd megawatts of installed power uh, for, for their process. 30, 30 megawatts is a rule of thumb for an, 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 an I know there's, a, well, I'm saying, I'm going to say an average yeah. mine, but the 30 megawatts yeah. is a typical size for a power plant yeah. for a remote mine. So that yeah. this is a big, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of power, a lot of juice. Concentrated only, power. Only, so you, only for the mine itself, or will that include the man camps and the, and the, and the, you know, the. That's, that's for the processing plant in the mine. That doesn't mm. include the mine itself. <laughs> it's the it's the um, right. So so these enterprises are enormous, and they right. consume a lot of concentrated power, and they're in geographically remote areas. So they're not they're often not attached to the power grid. Right. And so they've right. got to have their own power source locally, and so we, we've done it with, with gas, sometimes coal, but usually gas. And in, and uh, old fashioned way to do it was with um, oil based gensets. Right. But the the, the the oil generation hasn't progressed into the modern world because the operations got so large that there were scale up problems gotcha. and they could go to gas and then so, and so they, they could work but uh, and then the truck and shovel fleet is often run on diesel you've got like diesel generating electric in, e in each unit and so we are consuming a lot of energy of different kinds so if we were to take out and, and what this is one of the future works that we are looking at doing if you were to remove all fossil fuels from the mining process what would mining look like Right. And because you, you've got things, they've got the idea now of these large dump trucks could be battery operated. And so what I'm not seeing is the performance of those battery operated trucks compared to a diesel operated truck. Like how long can they run uh, uh, and operate and how, carrying and how, much a load? The, and how much do the batteries yeah. weigh to move the ore that they're carrying, yes. which is yeah. the thing that pops into my head right away, because these batteries on a on just an old, a light duty vehicle or half a ton or, you know, a thousand pounds. I mean, I can't imagine what they would weigh on a big, on a big haul truck. That would be just an enormous amount. And so would you've also got the problem of how long would it take to charge that battery? So like a, a diesel fueled truck would, would run for a shift of say 12 hours without need re refueling. Right. But, uh, so how long can one of these battery trucks run for and how long do they need to recharge? And so now you, uh, a mine is based around its, it's designed around its equipment. Like how far, how high, and how deep can the excavators dig? That and that, uh, uh, followed by um, the equipment to get the ore in, in and out of certain locations. Right. But if you've got a logistical problem of these trucks need to stand down to charge, where do you charge them? How do you charge them? What sort of form will that charging station be? And that logistics will change the entire dynamics of the truck and shovel fleet. Now. I'm not saying it's not possible. What I'm saying is the business model behind that has not been developed. So then you've got the idea of the power needed to run the mill. And that's all electricity, 
and that electricity has to be generated either locally or brought in somehow, right? And and if that is powered on non-fossil fuel systems, uh, wind and solar, it, it'd be very difficult to actually consider that. I've seen geothermal considered. Like if they d drug a really, really deep hole and they got like geothermal energy out, that, that might work. But it's right. dependent on location. Like, is there a geothermal deposit that's useful? Uh, and the other thing that's often talked about is small-scale nuclear. And the large mining companies think that's the way they're going to go. The problem is the nuclear power plant fleet can't expand fast enough to be useful. Uh, you can't make enough of these things quickly enough. Uh, and the handling of the spent nuclear fuel assembly rods uh, coming out the other end, the, the mining industry has no concept of what they're getting themselves into they're like how do they actually do that current thinking is they'll just you know just put it in the waste dump and and, and it's it's fine but they, they don't understand the idea of you need cooling ponds and there's different kinds of snf and you've got to uh, uh store it in certain ways and and yeah and it's it's quite a complex process so the idea of just taking everything nuclear might be the only way to keep mining going but the logistics of doing that may not be possible and so you're it's adding yes. well i mean whether you're talking about the batteries or the nuclear for heat or well you, i guess process heat isn't really what you need in a mine you need that electricity to run the, yeah. the grinding mills and the separation yeah, exactly. and, and so on so i know in, in petrochemicals process heat is important but not so much for mining um mm -hmm. i'm going to just in table five of the report you list copper near the top you talk about this issue of you estimate that the amount of copper needed to produce one generation of technology units. So electric vehicles don't last forever. They wear out. They yeah. have to be replaced. Uh, same with uh, with uh, solar panels and wind turbines to phase out would would be 4.3 billion tons. And if I'm reading this correctly, it, it says at current rates of production, that would take 180 years. Yep. I mean, this seems right. <clears throat> this seems absurd on its face. But I mean, let's assume that you're 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 off by a factor of four. You're still talking 160 I mean, or 65 years, or no? I'm what is it? Uh, uh, 45 years, something like that. I mean, you're still talking about a very the the amount of time required to mine that one commodity, copper, which we mm -hmm. talked about a little bit. I mean, it just seems absurd on its face. It, 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 but yet, here's the question that I wanted to put to you. In thinking about this, and we chatted a few weeks ago, why have policymakers ignored this? I mean, you know, I see these fancy studies and I've had people on from Princeton and Stanford and, you know, these elite academics are saying, oh, well, we'll do all this and we'll put all this out there and we'll do, you know, it's going to be fine and hundreds of gigawatts of new renewables. And yet they don't think about these material inputs. Is there is is this just a blind spot in these in, in academic and policy making that they're in academia and policy makers that they're just not considering first principles about how you would possibly even do this? How do you explain that we're at this point without having a ver a serious deep dive into these numbers? So the answer, simple answer to that is yes. But let me unpack that before we do back to copper. Yeah. Our target of 4.3 billion for the first generation of tech, which would only last, you know, 10, 20 years before we have to fix it, you know, do it all again, you know, whatever it is. Between from 2020, the year 2020, back to 4000 BC, we mined 700 million tons of copper. To keep up with economic demand the way it is now, like this, in, in the system the way it is now, we're going to do the same in, 20, in the next 22 years. We will mine 700 million tons in the next 22 years. And that's just keeping up on the demand curve the way uh, our current economics thinks things are going to go. Right. So if, so if on, I may just interrupt, yeah, I just want to yeah. be clear. So you're saying in, in all of human history, 700 million tons. We humans have mined seven and, and mined a total of 700 million tons of the final product of copper. Yeah. And you're yep. saying to uh, what we're going to need in the next two decades is another 700 million tons. Yep. That's, that's a study done by USGS. And that and that 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 is a they've they've done a curve based on a prediction of economic growth, you know, material brought to the market. We all want to expand, and uh, so that's actually what they think they're going to do. So on top of that, right, we now want to electrify everything, which means we want 4.3 billion tons of copper on top of that. Now that means, right, we are going to mine 6.2 times the historical volume of copper to make the first generation of stuff to replace what we have now. <clears throat> and so what I'm what I'm trying to say here is this is simply not going to work out the way we think. 
Yeah, so the reality is going to improve. But to repeat what you just said, that it, to achieve this, we would have to have it increase our copper production by a factor of six on an annualized basis. We'd have to have. No, 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 no. The, the, the total quantity needed for the first generation, right? The first generation of stuff uh, is going to be 6.2 times the historical quantity for the last 4,000 years. I got you. The, the annual. Uh, you'd, you'd have to do a calculation what the annual production would have to be but uh yeah the idea that we're going to do all that in 10 20 years is ridiculous yeah, it's, it's just not going to happen uh, <clears throat> so how do you maintain you the way you just said it's ridiculous and so i mean but as you're saying it i can detect a little bit of a smile because you're looking at this with this you know you you your numbers, your graphics. I mean, I, I don't know how long it took took you to do the report. Yeah. I mean, and I, I write. You know, I've written books, but they're only well, I say only three hundred pages or something. And you've written a thousand, and with heavy with graphics and so on. But I detect in your, in even in your tone, this kind of you're not scoffing, but you're also just kind of, uh, I don't even know what the right word is, amused by the 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 the. Oh, it's the, not quite an amusement. I I, I first. I first tabled what, these what's ideas. The, what's, the, what's the right word then? It's uh, um, um, incredulity, dis, uh, uh, disappointment, uh, it, it, possibly relief. Now, let me unpack why that is. Because I first tabled these ideas in two thousand and nine to the mining industry in Australia, and that was my first being burned at the stake um, exercise. <laughs> you, know, uh, you, know, <laughs> you weren't welcome at the party. Was that the? Uh... Um, they they seemed to think I was a little strange, and they said, "Why would you say that?" Uh, I was also taken aside and quietly told, please don't tell this to any sponsors. You're going to cost us money. Right. And so what they were basically saying, we believe, and we'll get back to the belief section in, in a minute, that what you are suggesting is incorrect. It's wrong. You're, you're, you're a doomer. You, you've, you, you're a chicken little. The sky is falling. And people like you are always proven wrong. And so at the time, even though I had some data, which to me made the case, the data wasn't in a form where people had no choice but to see it. Now it is. And so now I can say things like that, and they can't shoot me and throw me off the stage anymore because I can present them data to say, well, okay, here's what I've put together. You tell me how to spin this data out cap. And it can only be spun you know, one of several ways. You, know, you cannot refute this now. You can discuss it. You can not agree with it, but it can't be refuted. And so it's actually a relief that I'm finally in this place because I've made choices in my career uh, going along, which um, I've ended up going for jobs that weren't as lucrative as they could have been because of my understanding of this stuff. And so there was this, um, it's almost like a validation that the choices of doing so for the last 10, 12 years have been the correct ones. Uh, uh, you know, um, I, so the I relief is a, the different. release. The relief is a validation that now you yeah. have the numbers and say, <clears throat> and you can challenge this, the the policymakers, <clears throat> yeah. the academics, and say, "Well, prove me wrong. Here are the numbers." Yeah. So that, that, so that, imagine, that, yeah. Imagine if you will, you came up with a, a thesis that you're the only one. I, th I think there was only uh, one other person at the time who had even said this out loud, and that was Chris Martinson in his crash course. And in fact, at the time, I was working on the energy consumption necessary for grinding right and and he actually put together i'd seen the concepts before but he put together into a map that was understandable and i learned a lot from um watching chris's work and, and, on, and forgive me i don't know who i don't know who chris martin oh, is and okay. i don't know if our, our, our listeners okay. do. Chris so, so the, he's he's quite famous now he wrote a book called the crash course if you type the crash course or peak prosperity into youtube it'll come up uh and he has a series of YouTubes that describe the relationship between energy, finance, and the environment. And he's done it in a way that he takes on the technical concepts, but makes it accessible to the average person. Uh, I recommend you uh, look, at, look at him, and if sure. you can do it, get him on your podcast, because he's actually one of our thought leaders. Anyway, so he was the first person to actually say uh, uh, in a public forum that the um, energy energy and mining are actually linked right and i was actually sort of working on it at the time but he actually said it out loud mm. right and so um yeah and so it, it's um it, it was truly remarkable work in the beginning so when i first actually presented this to the mining industry at large they go well we don't quite 
you, you, we, we don't we don't understand what you're doing. You know, we'll, we'll let you live because we like your other work, but but could you please not say this publicly anymore? And so I was actually able to. Uh, so so imagine if you will, if you actually had an idea that actually was a thesis that proved something vital was wrong in an industry that involved a lot of money, and you were the only one around. And you stood up on stage and you said this and you're all alone and the entire audience would really wish you you'd get a hobby and you know you, you take up macrame or something <laughs> shut, right. shut the hell up yeah right so so and then imagine 12 years of this now we're in a place where i'm um, that that original thesis was actually correct because all the way along it's this is uh, people everyone around me says you're damaging your career by doing this you're, you're actually not helping anyone and and so the relief is Okay, the original idea was valid. Thanks. <laughs> and now, and now you have the numbers. Well, it's interesting. I, this your report, uh, and by the way, it's, it's available on on your website. I want to make sure and, and uh, uh, mention your website, Simon dot com. M I C H A U X. All of your reports are available there. Um, but that you're now you're finding that in fact you have allies and there was a report that came out in September now roughly a year your report came out in August of 2021 if I remember yep. correctly benchmark mineral intelligence just issued a report just in the last few weeks saying that to a, to just for the mining for the batteries alone would require something on the order of 350 or 380 new mines to be constructed mm -hmm. Which yep. on its face just seems like, oh come on! And they were just talking about batteries, if I'm if yep. I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, that's Is right. that, Did you see that report? Does that ring true I with what you? Uh, so we we were in the same direction. Um, so everyone who writes these reports will operate under a series of assumptions. My assumption map is different to their assumption map, and I was going after a different set of targets. But we we're saying essentially the same thing. The task in front of us is enormous. And how um, long does it take to to permit and get them uh, from? when you find a mine or you find a deposit from that initial discovery of the deposit you know that there's the commodity there that you want whether it's a you know beryllium or manganese or zinc or whatever from that discovery to getting actual metal production how long does that typically take a decade or more well uh no it also depends on where in the world you are so so if every thousand deposits discovered one or two become mines that's that's a rule of thumb so to one, go out from of a, one a, or two one or two out of a thousand that's the hit rate. That's the hit rate. Okay. Because just because you've made a discovery doesn't mean it's economic, and just because it's economic doesn't mean it's going to start. Right. Um, right. So, so to get to the point where you've got uh, the first trace of any kind of mineralization to the point of a discovered deposit is about ten years, mm -hmm. you know, ten to fifteen years. But then to go from a discovered reserve deposit is now considered a reserve. Right. To go from that to a producing mine is another 10 to 15 years, depending on where you are. Um, in, in parts of, say, like um, in Australia, they have, they set the record for 12 months to go from a deposit to a functioning mine. And that's now a world record. But in places like Finland, that can be 40 years. Wow. Right. Because of the regulations, hoops that a mining company will have to go through to get things going. Well, and we've seen that here in the U.S. with uh, deposits in, in Minnesota that were nickel deposits. I think there was a, a very a mine that was, the deposit was very well known, and 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 Michigan produces a lot of uh, and Minnesota, uh, but Minnesota, I, I guess it was actually in Minnesota. If I'm, I'm trying to remember, but a very large deposit. The mine, the 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 the, the deposit was very well known and and uh, had been well studied. And the Biden administration refused to issue a mining permit there. And we saw a similar thing in Alaska. I mean, these are just in the last few weeks. So I guess with it, adding in the permitting issue is just the, the unpopularity of mining in yeah. general, right? That just the, so the, that touches that touches on one of the difficulties we face. The people who are making decisions at the moment don't understand the full network of challenges. They understand they, you know, they think they've got one set of issues. But you know, if we actually did um, what was asked of us, and we shut down all fossil fuels and all mining tomorrow. We would usher in a dark age. That's it. We're done. Because for our Maslow hierarchy of needs of society, we need technology to deliver that now. You don't grow your own food, or at least I don't. Right? Uh, someone else does that on the other side of the world sometimes, and it's delivered to you. Right. Right, right. So technology does that. That technology is actually supplied by raw materials of all kinds, and energy is one of them. So if we, uh, you know, the Biden administration is saying, you you will not open a mine here, or you will not 
this pipeline can't operate. We won't accept fossil fuels anymore. Problem is, we have not yet constructed the aft oil plan yet. Right. Right. So we're not forcing a transition away from fossil fuels. We're shutting down activity where people's lives are just being destroyed. We haven't done the work yet. So I, even I, I would it, repeat that if you don't mind that last point because that we're not actually making <laughs> by shutting down it. hydrocarbons. We're not it, we're not engaging in an energy transition. We're just shutting down one part of the industry that's necessary for the energy transition. Is that a fair way? Yeah, to that's say correct. What you repeated, it, it, which yes, you it said? requires it requires energy to do anything industrial, and to make the after fossil fuels plan will require energy and industry. We need to manufacture a whole lot of things. Let's say wind turbines, if if that's the way we go. Right. At the moment, we need fossil fuels to do that, right? And the capability to make that took 40 years to develop industrially. These factories need to be built. Right. If you don't build the factories, you don't get the stuff. So if you turn the, turn the switch off and say, right, no more oil, that's it, gone. Uh, the factory that doesn't use oil has not been constructed yet. We haven't even worked out how to do it yet, let alone construct it. And once it's constructed, then we've got to produce the goods. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take to to make 1.4 billion electric vehicles? Well, which was the, the point, one of the points you yeah. made, that, and and I've seen those varying numbers on the population of the world automotive fleet, and uh, you know, 1.2, 1. 1.0. 1. But I was glad to see that updated number of 1.4 billion because right now in the U.S., I have these numbers. I just gave a lecture on it yesterday. Mm -hmm. The, of the U.S. auto population, auto fleet, it's about 280 million, and electric vehicles account for one half of one percent. Correct. Of, that's, so of that, that total, number. that's of the total fleet. And so this that's, idea that we're going to, oh, we're going to just make 270 million more of them. Well, hold on just a minute here. That's, a, that's not a small challenge. So all of my numbers, as large as they are, are conservative, very conservative. That number of 1.4, the real number is over 1.5. And, and possibly even 1.6 by now, because the estimate was made on each country stitched together. And some of those country estimates were back in 2015, mm. and some were in 2012. Right. Right. So, so they're 10 years out of date and things have been growing since then. So back to the question of why is this happening? Right. Why did no right. one look? And I've been giving this some thought because when I first arrived in Europe, there were all these blind spots I saw, and one of them was mining. Because in Europeans don't like mining. Right. They don't right. allow mining. It's not fashionable, blah, blah, blah. Not in my backyard. But what they will do is buy products off the market. They want someone else to do the mining for them while we lecture them how we're more sustainable than they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> by the way, I like the way you put that. that's, that's funny. <laughs> so, so they've got more money than us. And so we can't even out economize them anymore. We're in danger of Darwinizing ourselves. Um, the term Darwinizing, uh, we remove ourselves from the gene pool by doing something stupid. Mm. Um, no, so, in, in fact, European leadership at the moment is at, at the moment right now has got the look of someone about to do something flamboyantly stupid. But uh, so, so back to the belief, belief thing. Flam What's flamboyant, happened? flamboyantly stupid. Now, I like that one. That's a good <laughs> phrase too. What do you mean? What they're doing about to do something flamboyantly stupid? I, I would argue they've already done some things that are flamboyantly stupid by over investing in renewables, shutting down coal and nuclear plants, relying too much on imports. I mean, these are the, the, the hitting the points I've been making now for more than a year. But what what is it that there is flamboyantly stupid? Underscore that for me. So choices of of. Uh, the economic sanctions they've engaged in both against Russia and China. Mm. We are dependent on Russia for energy. We are dependent on China for the manufacture of almost all the goods we need. We refuse to allow manufacturing to be viable on our own territory. And once we do decide to do it, it will take 10, 20 years to develop that manufacturing. Our choices have led to uh, a situation where our civilian population is now in serious trouble in the next few months over winter. And industries, industrial sites are all collectively saying, you know what, screw you, hippie, we're leaving Europe and we're going somewhere else. And they're going to the United States and they're going to China, where they won't have their energy source politicized. Right. Right. And so what Europe has done has arranged its own deindustrialization in context of where they depend on that industrialization to survive. Dumb. 
Well, and and the and I, I've I've written about this and talked about this many times. But Euro Metau, it was in September, issued uh, sent, sent a letter to the European Commission saying what you're exactly what you're saying. We're looking at permanent yep. deindustrialization. That this is, yes. and once our smelters, <clears throat> these were the non-ferrous metal producers saying, once our smelters close, we're done. We're not coming back. And they made this so, point very very clear. So historians, future historians will look back on this era, and they might call this entire era all over the world the era of play silly games, win stupid prizes, right? And that's not just for Europe either, because our policymakers are making decisions with the assumption that raw materials, including energy, will always continue. Well, it's interesting you say that. So if you don't mind, one of the questions I had here, energy return on energy invested. I know that, or E-R-O-E-I, um, it's a familiar a term that it's familiar with me uh, in, to me because I study these things. But that seems at the root of a lot of what we've discussed already about this, the, the ball mills, I believe they were called for mm -hmm. pulverizing the, the ore into yep. smaller and smaller grain sizes right. so the, the metal can be extracted. Can, if you don't mind, give us a quick explanation of what energy return on energy invested means and why it matters so much. Okay, so there's a, there's a few things here. This uh, EORI term is a blunt instrument, and I'm, it's on the list of things to do to reinvent it. Mm. Right, so let's, it starts with energy, energy source. Let's take oil. When oil was discovered in the 1900s or the early 1800s, sorry, uh, it really was a case of if you dig a relatively shallow borehole and oil would gush out and, and you'd and it was spurred up into the air and, and you just collect it in a barrel and it was almost ready to be used straight away. In fact, they used to uh, say that you could actually put it on your salad and eat it. <laughs> right? Uh, 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 um, th that's something I don't quite understand. Okay. Um, no, no I, it, I, I, would, I wouldn't eat it, but yes, but it was, but the, so, the, or the, what, the crude grade in some cases, and then this was true yes. in the East Texas field in some, in some cases, the well out of the well, it was so, it was such high quality crude that you could almost put it straight into your gasoline tank in your vehicle. That's correct. Vehicle. Yeah. Right. So, so, so what that meant was, um, and it was a very, very dense energy source. Now, how much energy did you put in compared to what energy did you get out? Now, uh, in oil around 1900, uh, for, for example, for every barrel of oil of energy you put in, you got 100 back. Uh, uh, and some of the early deposits were 500 to one. Right. Right. And so what that meant was it was an amazing energy source. You didn't have to do that much to get some amazing energy that was very useful. Uh, uh, and, and so then as time has gone on, right, we've had to do more. We've had to dig deeper. Uh, we've had to go into the ocean now and, and, and drill really deep. And when we get it out, it's now quite uh, a lot of sulfur in it. Uh, and, and, uh, and we've got to now go through a series of refining steps to get a product that's useful. So it's, there's a lot more infrastructure involved and it's more complex and it's more expensive. Right. So we're having right. to put more effort in for every unit of oil that we get out. Right. And so uh, and now oil's somewhere around the 20, you, you, you're like a big band. It's, it's, it's around, say, 20 to 1. Right. So for every unit of energy we put in, we're getting 20 back. And so as time has gone on, things have declined. Now, then you've got the other problem of complexity. Now, a, a good example of this is the first Model T Ford car. It was pretty simple, but it did the job. Four wheels, could drive from A to B uh, and, and all that. And so a sports car at the time um, cost a certain amount and it was relatively simple to make. Jump forward to, say, the year 2022, we've now got, say, a Lamborghini. This is what the sports car of the day was. Much, much, much more competent. Can go further, can go faster. But the value chain to make that Lamborghini is much more complex than it was to make the Model T Ford. Right. So a direct right. comparison would be a Model T Ford compared to, say, a Toyota. Or, or a traditional family car, much more complex involved, many more parts. The parts uh, have more resources behind them, but to do the basics. So the whole system has had to expand greatly to allow this to happen. So but, the, the, but the resulting mobility is the same. I've still got, been able yeah. to drive to Tulsa or wherever, yeah. but and and yeah, I'm the, it's more comfortable, and I got air conditioning, and I can listen to my iPod or whatever. But the, I see what you're saying. So yeah. it's not just the energy return in, in terms of barrels in versus barrels <laughs> out, or tons of coal in, yeah. tons of coal out. It's also the complexity of the system that you've built around that extraction process and the ultimate end end product that you're building. Is that fair? Right. Is that a fair That's information? Right. Right. So now, so now things get tricky 
if you want to compare the energy EROI uh, ratio between, say, fossil fuels and, say, renewable energy, since to get the renewable, let's say, a wind turbine, right? So um, you, 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 how do you, is it the calorific value? Is it the energy it produces? Or how do we get to this point? And so you've got to include all the materials to make the wind turbine. Right. And, and then does that include the mining? Does it include the transport, the manufacture? Uh, and, and so it's very hard to compare apples with apples. And with things like wind and solar, for them to be viable at the moment, for example, all of the wind uh, um, turbines in Denmark, they're highly intermittent. Right. The power goes up and down all over the place. And because it's, you know, the weather. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, we balance that power with power from Germany and Sweden to balance Denmark. Every country is balancing every other country. Most of the time, we use fossil fuel systems to do that. Right. Right. So the idea of having a renewable energy grid that is actually self-balancing, we haven't done that yet. And so this is where we have the idea of the power buffer for wind and solar to be uh, viable. If you include that buffer you know, uh, and, and the, the energy, embedded energy to make that buffer, and there's several technologies you can use to do that, then the energy return and energy invested for wind, uh, solar in particular goes negative. That is, you're putting less in than what you, you, you're you putting too much in and you're getting too less out. Right. Well, so let me just challenge you a little bit on that, Simon. So if I was a, a skeptic, or and, and I am a skeptic, just kind of generally, right? I'm a reporter. I'm, I'm paid to be skeptical. But, oh, you know, I just, oh, well, you know, here's Michaud. He's a mining guy. You know, he's, you know, of course, he's going to, you know, shit on, on renewables. And he's going to shit on solar and wind and because he wants to mine more coal or something. So how would you respond if there's something like that? I mean, that because that's the seems kind of like the knee jerk reply, right? And I've seen this myself against some of the things I Oh, well, you know, you, you know, you know, you're an oil guy, or you're, it's not, you know, it's ad hominem, of course, right? But how do you, you put in the work? How do you reply to us if, if someone said that to you? There was a chess match in actually getting this work out. There were six reports planned. Right. And I knew we'd get to this point. The first report, and they were, they were published in a reverse order. So the first one to come out, people go, this is really strange. You know, uh, it's interesting, I suppose, but we don't know why you did it. Right. So the first report to come out was the report on the oil industry. Mm. And I said, I'm now going to look at what is the Green Revolution trying to replace? Because the, the, they, they said, what, do you really understand what fossil fuels do for us? The answer is no. And so I wrote a report to show that. And it really, uh, what was the first fire that I lit? Uh, and this was to show that oil is becoming unreliable. And the phrase in the beginning was, we should leave oil before it leaves us. Mm. Right. So in other words, I had made a case that and this oil report, sorry, was, was, was for the Geological Survey of Finland, it was. just it as was. the latest one. Okay, thank you. And it was published in 2019. And I, uh, I actually... Uh, uh, published the idea that you know we, we've seen a localized peak in in peak in oil in, in November 2018, and it turned out I think I was the first person to say that. I didn't mean to, but but um, so the idea was a tour of duty to everything associated with the oil industry: how we extract it, where do we get it from, um, what's it for, what's it cost, uh, and it was like a tour of duty through the whole thing. And the oil industry was a bit displeased. When I released that at first, because they normally don't like, uh, uh, they, they like to keep such things private and internal. And this was a public doc document. So when I hear people saying, you're just an oil guy, I give them the oil report. So you read this report and you look me in the eye and say, is that true? Mm. Right. So, so what I've done is I've destroyed both sides of the equation. You know, the existing system is becoming unreliable slash it's toast. The plan to replace the existing system, green transition, is impractical and it is also toast. And I use that one-two punch to say, we need to get cracking now and we need to develop a new plan now. And and everyone in the room is crapping on, please stop that. Because no one's really thought through the implications no, of what we're, no. what we're talking about. Well, so let me switch to the, one of the other, uh, this now, so were I to recommend people to look at one part of your work or another, I think that you've got a shorter report. I think it's about 50 pages uh, that was also released last year. It's called the mining of minerals and the limits of growth. 
Yep. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll just read this. You wrote that the demand for metals of all kinds have been increasing just as the grade of ores processed has been decreasing. Global reserves are not large enough to supply enough metals to build the renewable fossil fuel, non-fossil fuels industrial system or satisfy long-term demand in the current system. Mineral deposit, mineral deposit discovery has been declining for many metals. The grade of processed ore for many of the industrial metals has been decreasing over time, resulting in declining mineral processing yield. This has the implication of increasing in mining energy consumption per unit of metal. We've talked about that already, but we've heard about this phrase limits to growth many times, yeah. right? The Club of Rome. Yeah. Is that are the Malthusians? I'm, 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 Malthusians might not be the right word here, but are the Malthusians being proven right now? I mean, is this is this are the, the is the, are the pigeons coming home to roost here in terms of the uh, limits to growth in Malthus? See, instead of no, what I instead of saying in a black and white way, to say is are the Cornucopians right or are the Malthusians right? What I'm trying to say is there are several options to maneuver around these things mm. where we have like a different future again. Uh huh. Right. But you're saying, but you've also said it's not going to be nuclear, and so I, I tend toward the cornucopians. I'll be clear. Yeah. You know, I tend to think, and I, you know, I look around. The, and uh, Matt Ridley was my guest on the podcast just this week, uh, and and he said things are getting better. Why? Why is he hopeful for the future? Because things are demonstrably better. People are richer, healthier, li living longer. Mm -hmm. But you're also not as as. Uh, uh, you know, I'm adamantly pro-nuclear, have been for a long time, but you're, you yeah. make the point that nuclear can't, if I'm remembering exactly what you said here, it can't grow quickly enough to yeah. to fill the void here. Why is that? Why do you, you're, you're, so, you, you seem to agree that nuclear is part of the answer for the future, but you're not as, you're not terribly bullish on it. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's a fair assessment. Uh, I'm a fan of nuclear. I think we should pump as much R&D into developing new nuclear technology. I'm very interested in thorium. And there's a whole lot of new nuclear technology that we could use. But we've got to get off our asses and do things properly. Since the beginning of the nuclear industry in the 50s, we've made a lot of promises of what we're going to do. Mm. We are going to make proper storage facilities. We are going to process our existing waste. Uh, the, the, we've always taken the cheap option out and, and put things off in the past. Like uh, There's a lot of stuff in power, powered cool storage that doesn't have to be there. Like Finland's just made a, the, um, the first deep geological repository in the world. Right. Why are we the first? Seriously, guys, the nuclear industry has been going since the 1950s and they've only just done this? Right. So, so what has to happen is all the support infrastructure about the nuclear industry has to be done properly. And then we have to get serious about research and development and get the really, really good tech out there. Like if someone cracked generation, uh, um, fourth generation nuclear power, um, Gen 4 reactors, and that could change things too. Right. But it's a very complex value chain, and it's expensive, and it requires a lot of industrialization to be done correctly. And that industrialization at the moment is supported by fossil fuels. But the problem is, even if we got behind the nuclear industry and we stopped all the, um, uh, the activist attempts to stop it or slow it down, if we got behind, you imagine if we built um, 25 new reactors a year in the global system and we did that every year from 2025 onwards that is would put a hell of a strain on the industrial system right but let's say we did that you know, you know uh, each, at the moment it takes about 20 years to build a reactor what if right. we reduce that to five years so i did a simulation so look if if we if we all cut the crap and get on with this would it work and so then i said how much electrical power could be generated by that expanding fleet and so the fleet would expand from, uh, say, um, 448 or 441 nuclear reactors up to about 2,500 or whatever it was. I took it out to the point where the existing resources which would be exhausted. And what I found were the, the was it takes time to build the new reactors. And let's say we've got a level of, if this is the electricity level that we need to get to to phase out fossil fuels, according to the rest of the calculations. That expanding nuclear power plant fleet would get 60% of the way there in about 70 years at that aggressive expansion rate, mm -hmm. right? And that's the problem. So uh, it's now, like always, it's a scale problem. It's always about scale. Yeah, and so uh, we will also exhaust all existing resources. Yes, we can go find more, right? But then the, the Achilles heel is uh, with that is now you've got an unprecedented mountain of spent nuclear fuel to manage, and that's a scale problem that we don't can't. We can't really do it properly now. 
but we're not we we can but we choose not to we use half ass measures cheap right. measures in fact that report there's a whole simulation about if everything going forward was generation two the reason that is the case and <laughs> Cross my heart, I, I actually was sitting in these meetings in Brussels with the European Commission, and I, one ass clown, whose name will not be mentioned to protect the guilty, <laughs> said um, yeah, that all nuclear reactors going forward should be Generation 2 because they're cheaper and they're quicker to build, and because they're older, we've got more experience in running them. Right. Take him outside and... <laughs> um, right, and so for that reason, have you noticed anger gets shit done? All right. Well, that that was one of the points where I said, right, this needs to change. Uh, these these ass clowns are in charge of our lives, and that they really don't know what they're talking about. And and they, they they were laying down the hammer of this is how things were going to be, and they were dictating policy, and everyone around them was saying yes, sir, no, sir, let's do it. Right, and so that's what I sort of approached uh, with all that. So. Nuclear is the only way we're going to be able to deliver concentrated bits of power, right? Especially in certain geographical locations, right? And 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 and, and in and certain certain circumstances. So nuclear absolutely is part of our future mix, but it's not the magic bullet that solves everything, right? Not here's the here's the appropriate phrase. Not in its current form, right? If someone was to do some research and development and evolve the system so it was different, that's different. <clears throat> Right. That's a different story. And there's a lot of excitement around it, and, <clears throat> and I understand why. And I was in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago at the IAEA meetings, and there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm around these SMRs. But the problem is, right now, they're all paper reactors. They're not, none of yeah. them are really existing. But let me go back to the scale thing, because one of the numbers <clears throat> that jumped out again to me from your report, and you calculated that, well, I know for a fact that in, in, in the BP numbers that the global electricity generation last year was around 28,000 terawatt hours and the U.S. accounted for about 4,000 terawatt hours, four petawatt yeah. hours. Um, but you calculate the world would need to generate an additional 36,000 terawatt hours a year to displace hydrocarbons. But the part that jumped out at me that you said that it would require now, uh, just to be clear, so we're generating 28,000 terawatt hours a year from 46,000 power plants. That's your calculation mm -hmm. by what, what yeah. is glo exists globally here in the in in the uh, now in the world. But then it would require building 400, I'm sorry, 586,000 new non-fossil power stations. So yep. we would need a more than 10x, what is that, 12x Mm -hmm. increase in the number of power plants on the pl on the face of the earth in order to electrify everything right this is the goal yep. right i mean it's just a staggering number so we need to increase the generation by 1.5 times but we need a more than a tenfold increase in the number of power plants why okay now remember this is 2018 numbers right if the, the whole system's supposed to grow by by a factor of four between 2018 and 2050 I'm repla I'm replacing 2018. Okay, <laughs> so it's worse again. Uh, so um, what's happening here is the energy return and energy invested nature of renewables is much lower than fossil fuels, right? And 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 so what I did was I collected the some statistics on power generation systems across all systems I looked at. You know, wind, solar, geothermal, all of it. It's about ten thousand systems and i did some statistics on them and so for the calendar year 2018 what did they actually do not what they promised not what they claimed they were going to do not the pr so how, many, how, many, how many do? how many watt hours did they actually yeah. produce right. yeah so how, how what did they produce uh and so i uh, so i had the i was able to do some statistics what was the average what was the standard deviation what was the maximum minimum but it was things like what were their operating hours hmm you know, and they, like solar, solar PV was generating power across that calendar year globally 11.4% of the time, right? So a nuclear power reactor has got like a 92% availability. So the or this is also called capacity factor, right? That yeah. the, what is yeah. the, how, how often are they running? How, how What percentage of the time in over yeah. a year or a day or are they running at 100% yeah. of rated output? Yeah, that's right. And okay. so, right. And so... I worked out like I worked out how much power we need to deliver, and I had an energy mix based on what the IEA predicted 2050 would be in terms of what proportions of the energy system would go to the different energy systems. Right. 
like, like 30, uh, 35% would be wind uh, of solar, 35% would be wind, that, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, so once we had the actual in power delivered over the year, I then got some statistics of what was the average performance of each of these systems in 2018? Right. How much power did they deliver, right, for the average system? What was the installed uh, power capacity of each average system? Right. And so well, if, if the average system delivered X number of ter terawatt hours, then we would need 20,000 of them to hit that target across here. That, that, that's how that calculation went. And so, so, you the, just right. did, so you did some algebraic, just some algebra to figure out what the, if this is the average, then how many do yeah. we need? Is that fair? It was a straight calculation. Right. Uh, even the word algebra is probably too complex to what actually happened. <laughs> the mathematics I used for this, I learned when I was 13. Okay, well, right. I, my uh, math stopped at tw age 12, So, but I do do a very yeah. little bit of algebra. Um, well, so is it, but I'm going to ask it again. I know just because it's your that report that you published on the, the um, uh, where you reference the mining of minerals and the limits to growth. Are, I want to ask it again because I just want to make clear that the Malthusians versus Cornucopians are are, are we actually at the limits to growth? I mean, is is, is the network now that I think about networks, right? And, and where you have these yeah. networks of of transportation, of mineral, you know, of 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 uh, fuel distribution, all these networks that work together, right? That it's we yeah. have a system of systems. Are, are 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 you arguing that the system of systems, the networks that we have now, are already at capacity, and we can't really build them out to the scale that would be required to make this energy transition either quickly or slowly? Is that is that a it's fundamental a part of where you're coming from? It's a bit more complex than that. Okay, our okay. system at the moment is growth based, right? We've been grow, 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 but like every other biological organism on the planet, this is what our biology tells us. So if the idea is growth and the goal is growth, then the Malthusians are correct. We've hit limits. We are hitting the limits of growth now or in the next 10 years or so. It's around now, right? If the Malthusians are right, uh, if the growth paradigm was to continue and we did nothing else, alternatively, uh, so that means the Cornucopians' plans to grow continually will not work. It's, it's about to roll off the cliff. And so the Cornucopians and the Malthusians are in the same boat, mm. right? So what I'm proposing is instead of actually doing the same thing, grow, 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 consume, consume, in a short-term context when, and thinking just like what's happening next week, have a real think about this. Because all human systems in the past, every ism you might think of, have been based on expansion and conquest. Right, you know, capitalism, right. communism, fascism, but they've all been based on expansion in some form. So we're talking about a human social contract that we've not seen before and no one really knows what it looks like. But if we are successful in developing the idea that we can live in a system where we don't, our material needs are not expanding like an amoeba, like Nate Hagens calls it the superorganism, right? If we can do this in a way where we don't need such a lot of stuff, Right, uh, and we can stabilize and 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 even start to contract. Because how much of what do we do is useless, or, or not useless? Sorry, not necessary. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so we have to change the, uh, the, the. There's going to be a requirement. Of, 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 well, you've said it kind of. In, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you said it exactly this yeah. exact way, but changing the idea of the social contract about what is right. what, what is to be expected, and that that right. we're going to have to accept slower growth, and that if we're going to muddle through, we have to accommodate this idea that we can't just uh, that infinite expansion is over yeah we have, to, we have to completely rebuild everything in terms of around the idea of like what do we actually need so what we want what we need and what we do become the same thing mm. we need a whole lot less right and and we are not cons we're not consuming so much from the natural environment of, of all resources of all kinds if we can do that then we've got a chance of actually sort of getting past this this challenge if we can't do that, then the Malthusians are right, as are the Cornucopians, and we're going off a cliff. I call this that lemming talk, mm. right? And, yeah, and so, so the answer is not as complex, not as um, simplistic as are the Malthusians right? Gotcha. Uh, so it is. Yeah. Well so, well, so let me ask you a question, since <clears throat> you're looking at this, and I ask this question of a lot of people, including people on, you know, I when I do lectures and and speeches and so on, and but um, also people on the podcast. So. You've looked at this from the bottom up, top down, sideways, every other way I think you can. 
So if you were if you had, you know, money to invest, you put it into commodities. I mean, that's the kind of the rage now uh, The people are worried about the value of uh, currencies. And so well, now's the time where those things have flipped and you should be investing in, in commodities and, and non ferrous metals, non uh, base metals. Um, that was what one of the people I talked to in Colorado this summer. What do you say? You've looked at all of this. What's what, where if you're putting your money or betting for your children's future or your you know family, what where do you put your money? So this answer might uh, surprise you because I've looked at the whole part of the system. Sure. Future yeah. is an alliance between industrial clusters, right? Society is going to reorganize itself uh, in context of what are the energy sources we have and industry will organize itself around those energy sources. People will organize themselves around those industry clusters. Right. And our food production will organize around the people with the understanding we now have very short value chains. So we're going to go from a global system to uh, a local decision making, but regional sourcing of re resources, right? And so, so it, it's, we're going to go on that. It's like a big decentralization. So if I was to invest money, uh, and I, I put forward the idea of an, a vertical integrated value chain, everything that you need from the raw material, let's say the mine, all the way out to the finished manufactured product, if we could somehow integrate that into one enterprise. Mm. Right, where, where, where the offtake agreements reach because it uh, it's going to be rough to actually maintain production in a smooth way that we need at the moment. So the conventional businesses will struggle to survive. So you'd find something that's vital, something that's really important, and uh, invest money in that, but you're investing money in a way where what you're investing has not only a feedstock built in, but a customer base built in as well that is part of the same business model mm. right right and, and so uh um that's one idea and and i think in the industry so as you're saying this i'm thinking well in my own head okay well what fits that that would be cargill or bungie or the big international food producers right that they would own a lot of the food the, the production and the processing and the marketing so would that would that fit in that what you're saying so you, also, you also have the idea that the large structures will break apart mm. these large international corporations will struggle to stay the way they are so i i always think of something small but vital something like um, a company that makes electric motors for example mm. right and, and the end product an electric motor because then someone in with their own workshop could take that electric motor and do something with it Right. But you've got to make it in the first place. So we're going small and simple, but vital, but then trace it all the way back to the original um, uh, value chain. Like you need copper and you need steel. You know, they're, they're your basic components to actually make that electric motor. Right. Right. So the other one is uh, food. You know, what will we need? We will absolutely need food. But food is going to change. Industrial fertilizers, for example, and herbicides and pesticides, and the idea that food is produced in Brazil and then shipped to Europe. That's going to be really hard to maintain. So now we're going to start producing food locally, right? Uh, and, and, and so how do we do that? Oh, it's small-scale organic. So then you've got all the stuff to do that. But what if we use industry to help with that? So I, I used to work on an organic farm, and one of my jobs was making compost. Right, and it's just being with a fork and tipping things over and you know, right. adding things. Right. What if we had a factory that did that, that took all these biological inputs and made a, a, um, a lot of fertilizer and then got that fertilizer out to farms? Well, that so if factory. I can interrupt, so what I, what I hear you saying is when this is a theme, I, I heard Peter Zion speak. <clears throat> uh, uh, in fact, it was just yesterday. He was here in Austin. Um, and it, this is one of the themes of his new book, uh, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, but it's reshoring, yes. right? That we're going yeah. to see now this trend toward globalization, this model has been is being blown up, right? And yeah. we're seeing it particularly being destroyed in Europe because of yeah. the obvious reasons. So uh, I'm, I'm hearing you say that, and if I think reshoring, uh, this accrues to the benefit of the U.S. So it goes to the, one of the questions that, what uh, what are your in your view because you're talking about reshoring and you're talking about vital industries so which countries are better positioned now in in the world relative to the rest of them I, i'm bullish on the u.s because of demographics yep. uh, energy supply etc <clears throat> what what countries are you bullish on given so, given what you're posing here is a very fairly dire outlook in terms of these energy transition ideas so so how i describe things to my daughters right is the system we were born and bred to serve is dying but we are not mm. that system 
whether it's fossil fuel based or renewable energy the way we think it is, is dead. Right, the dinosaur is dead, but the brain doesn't know it yet because the last of the blood still being pumped up the neck. <laughs> All right, no, right. And, and so from the ashes, a new system will rise according to new fundamental limitations. Now, all nations around the world have a list of pros and cons. And whether those pros and cons are going to mean anything comes down to human perception and human choices in each of those countries. Mm. You could be in a good position, but you could have dumbass uh, leaders doing dumbass things. Right. Right. And you could be in a challenging situation, but you could have good leadership and a good community and you'll make a go of it. Right. Uh, 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 and so it's it's it, it all comes down to us in many respects. The, the entire Nordic frontier is in a good position in energy context, but we need we need to heat our buildings. Right. But there's lots of geothermal, there's lots of hydro. Uh, we, we, we've got established, you know, um, biomass to heat uh, plants in a sustainable environment, blah, blah, blah. But we've got probably too much population that we can handle. The United States is an excellent position. Right, because it, it has in heritage industrial actions there. There, you had mining, you had smelters, you had factories. It's all gone now, but it's in your heritage to get it back. Mm, and enough. while most of your raw resources have been mined out, there's certainly a lot left that you can use if you're smart about it. You know, the, the whole fracking industry that that started up in 2008. You guys did some really stupid there. What you should have done instead of selling it to the rest of the world, keep it. You should have kept that oil for yourselves. Right. Right. But now it's all being used. <laughs> well, yeah, I, there's, so, a, there's a fair amount left yet. But so what you're an Aussie. So, I mean, if you had to say which. So give me three. So the U.S., uh, you mentioned Northern Europe already. But would Australia be in that list as Australia's well? Australia's in that list. Because of, of uh, because of, of rule of law and, and significant natural resources, commodities. It can be self-sufficient so, in a lot of things. Australia has a rule of law, yes, but we've lost sovereign control over much of our natural resources because we sold it off to foreign investment. Mm. Right. So these are human decisions. If we can get the human decision stuff sorted out and we can agree not to go to war with each other, Australia is in an excellent position, as is New Zealand, because uh -huh. we can grow our own food and we don't need to heat our homes to survive. But the environment is pretty... Uh, um, um, Challenging. It's pretty. It's pretty, pretty challenging compared to uh, uh, the rest of the world. So there, there are and, have, and relatively small populations given your land yeah. mass, right? I mean, New yeah. Zealand's you know fairly large, but yeah. very. I don't know what how many New Zealanders there are. Only a few million. Yeah. Right? yeah. So every every na every part of the world has an opportunity. Parts of the world will find it challenging uh, when you've got a large amount of population in a small area. Hmm. For example, China or right. India. Right. Right, you know, uh, they're in deeper shit than usual uh, because they're dependent on fossil fuel systems, like coal in particular in China. Right, right. right. So if and and they haven't actually, they're trying to construct the after oil systems, but there's not enough of them for all their population. So right. we have a situation right. in China, for example, that a small percentage of their population will be resourced, but everyone else is going to be not resourced, and then hilarity ensues. Um, so. Yeah, you know, Zion and others have talked about that, and and you add in the demographic challenge, which is the rapidly aging population, and it seems yeah. like that that uh, that's a big challenge as well. Yeah. So so um, there are places around the world I would like to be versus not like to be. Um, uh, F Finland's all right. We we have a lot of challenges here, but we have a lot of opportunities as well. It comes down to our leadership not doing dumb things. Right. For example joining NATO and then putting nuclear weapons on the Russian border. I mean, like, wh why would we do that? Mm. That that will then complicate our lives no end. Dumb. Like, we, we can take a perfectly good situation and we can bugger it, bugger it up completely by making decisions that are, that are not necessarily in alignment with our own long-term needs. Right. And, I, and I'm seeing every leadership group in the world doing that. There are a lot of challenges. Let me give a station break again. My, my guest is Simon Michaud. He is an Aussie who is now at the uh, Geological Survey of Finland. You can find out more about him at simonmichaud.com. Um, so we've been talking now more than an hour, Simon, and you've been gracious with your time. And I know we had to reschedule this, uh, this interview uh, once uh, already, but I don't want to keep you much more than an hour. Um, it's all good, mate. It's all good. 
who's done good work on this? I mean, you mentioned Chris Martinson, if I'm remembering yep. his. Uh, Chris Martinson, he's uh, he's done some excellent work. Uh, we've all there are lots of people around the world who've all got part of the picture. Mm. Right, we've all got part of the picture. Gail Tverberg in uh, our finite world, she does excellent work. She's Nicole been on, Foss. She's, been, she's been on the podcast and it's yeah, a remarkable. I mean, just I I thought. Well, I haven't had an actuary in, on my podcast, and my dad was in the insurance business, and I just thought, here she's a woman who's very modest. You know, she's retired. She has no, I don't want to say she doesn't have skin in the game, but she's not not talking her book. She doesn't have a book, right? You know, she's just trying to analyze the world in as way, an honest way as I, I can. She had this great line, which I thought she's talking about the financialization of the system, and she said, you can't eat money. And I just thought that was great because she's coming back to your point, which the world yeah. runs on molecules and we need molecules and, you know, we can flood the market with money, but we don't eat money. We need, we need molecules to make the world go around. And so, yeah, yeah I'm glad you mentioned her. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? So, yeah. Yeah. So, so Gail reviewed one of my reports and her ability to read a report and based on that reading, understand the tables of numbers was amazing. Her intellect is amazing. Right. So her modesty, I don't believe it. Um, <laughs> right. So um, she knows what yeah. she knows. And she's, yeah, yeah, that's very refreshing. That's good. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, so Nate Hagens does some excellent work uh, in understanding why the psychology, uh, we can come back to that question. Why are things happening at the moment? Because I have an, an opinion on why that is. So he, he's doing some excellent work. Richard Heinberg has done some uh, very good work and sustainability. Mm. Uh, yeah. There, there's, there's all sorts of, uh, people who've written books and 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 um, Nicole Foss, uh, she's not as active anymore, but she did some excellent work a couple of years ago, which is still quite valid because nothing's changed. Mm. Uh, and Heinberg, uh, his book was "The Party's Over," right? Wasn't that one yep. of his books? Yeah, yep. right. He's, yep, he's, he's right. Uh, calling an end to uh, coal or oil and natural gas was has been one of his uh, his uh, themes. Yeah, so he had part of the system. Uh, uh, he, he had his hands on part of the system. So then you've got guys like uh, um, R. Furman, who is doing some good work and mapping the oil industry at the moment, or or Bill Rees who's, and Mike Joy, who are actually looking at the ecological side of things. Right. You know, right. Uh, the, the list goes on. There's, 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 quite, a, <laughs> there's quite a few of them. Uh, um, Tad Petzik is based in Saudi Arabia. He's done some excellent work. Uh, I, I, and, I know Pacek for a long time ago. I've lost touch with him, but he's at uh, King Saud University, I believe, in, yeah. in Saudi Arabia. And Art Berman has been on the podcast. But uh, yeah. well, so those are good names. So uh, again, to, in, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to hit you with the questions that I ask all of my guests. So what are you reading yeah. now? What's on the top of your uh, book pile? Or do you have a pile of books? Or what, are you, what, what is it yeah, I'm, your attention at the moment? I'm reading about eight books at once. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, the top. Do you the read pile, them cover to cover, or you skim them? I, I skim a lot. Uh, it's, of it's, a, it's actually both. I buy a book and I'll flip through it and I'll skim it, and then I'll put it down and then I'll read it uh, cover to cover. And then the third step is if I need to find something, I'll go back to that book and then find a section in that book and then pull it apart and then dog ear it and underline it and yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. And 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 some books never get read because I never actually get time to. Right. Right. So uh, the fourth turning. The fourth turning is what I've got on the uh, bit at the moment. That's this uh, historical pattern in American culture. Every 80 years, there's a conflict, a major conflict. And between that, those conflicts, you've got four social generations. And each and this pattern goes back to 1492. Mm. Right? And so we're in the fourth turning now. Uh, and that was actually truly remarkable uh, how they've done that. I'm reading a book on cycles, um, which I can't remember. The cycles theory. I can't remember the author's name, but... Um, all, all our world around us, there's a whole series of cycles, and uh, we don't quite know what they all mean. But so I'm looking at that. Uh, I'm reading uh, Thucydides' Trap by Graham Allison. Hmm. Uh, it's a historical uh, work. Uh, uh, he, he was a historian who lived through the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens. Right. And he picked up on this pattern that uh, when a rising power uh, threatens an entrenched power. The, uh, most of the time, it results in war, and mm. so, and so we've got an entrenched power now. And so, uh, we've ha we've had uh, like a turning of empires, and we're at, we're at one of those stages now. And you know, China. Uh, it's not just China. The, my information is showing that it's actually the BRICS nations are actually forming a power block, and they're going to take on the Western power block. You know, the the Europe, UK, United right. States block and um 
they are playing their chess match better than we are. It sure seems to be the case since you, I mean, what pops to mind, I mean, you know, this, the U.S., the sanctions on China, the sanctions on Russia, um, it does seem the world is cleaving now more than, and, and of course, the Ukraine war has been a part of this, but it's, uh, so, maybe it was just looming anyway and was bound to happen, I don't know, but uh, that does seem to be the, one of the themes of the macro themes of the moment. Yeah. So I'm also writing a book um, uh, personally. That when I wrote the big report, it was a tour of duty through all energy systems I could find. Management asked me to take out a couple of sections because they were too controversial. You know what they were saying? This is there are no industrial app, uh, examples of this, right? This is energy. What I had found was a whole series of energy systems that were a different paradigm, but they're in our past, mm. right? Like Nikola Tesla, what was he doing? What was he proposing? What, how did it work? If it did work, how could we use it? Mm. Yeah, so you know, at zero point energy, what is that? Again, is it viable? Could we use it? Uh, I looked at the electric universe theory. Uh, I looked at uh, Michael Faraday's original work when he developed electrostatics. Mm. And a lot of stuff that was done way back when, he could have gone down a series of rabbit holes but didn't because the electric motor was invented and they forgot all about it. Mm. So I'm advocating we should look at these old ideas with new technology, cutting edge technology and knowledge. So you look at old ideas with new te existing technology. So the challenges of the future are now seen in a new light. Ah, I'm talking I, about by, generating... by, looking, by looking back in history. I have Faraday's yeah. quote here yeah. on my wall. Everything may be gained by energy and perseverance. Exactly. So so I'm, I'm, what I'm circling, these ideas all seem to connect together with the idea that what we call gravity, electricity and magnetism might be part of the same thing. And we've only partially understood them. And there's a lot of work from a theoretical physics point of view that we could do from a different paradigm to evolve that whole enterprise. I'm writing a book about this. I'm calling it the New Electric. Hmm. Right, good, so, so, I like so that. I like the I like the title. That's uh, that's good. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, well, so then, last question, Simon, because now it's been more than an hour, and I do, I do want to let you go. But uh, what gives you hope? We've talked about a lot of things that are fairly uh, bleak. What gives you hope? Mm -hmm. Well, I actually think uh, I am actually positive for the future with the understanding things get rough. What gives me hope, and this is how I talk to my daughters, is that humanity is now being put in a situation that was always going to be so. We always will take the easy way out. We'll always take the easy to get resources first. And now we're in a position where we can't put things off and we can't do things the easy way. Mm. So now when we're in the most challenging set of circumstances, humanity now will face certain things that it has put off facing. We are about to grow up, hmm. right? So no, now how many of us get through this window, that's another thing. But getting through this window of transformation, uh, what, what will human civilization look like on the other side? And frankly, how much of it will be? Uh, um, we now have the opportunity to face certain things and grow up as a species and get out of this adolescence. On the other side of this transformation, whether it's 50 years long or 100 years long or 20 years long, who knows what it's going to be. But on the other side of this, we can actually have a human civilization worth inheriting. The long term prospects of the human civilization is now in a better place. At the moment, we are running like an adolescent species we're consuming everything in our path like a pack of locusts right that is not sensible you know uh, uh if we are to be genuinely sustainable we've got to do things but it's not our technology it's a it's within us our own perceptions our own knowledge and our own belief structures why do we do certain things mm. should we do certain things so this is the only way we're going to face this stuff so while the next couple of years are going to be hard the work being done is actually more valuable and meaningful than any other generation before us. And so th that's a reason to get out of bed. Once we realize what, what what's going on, that's the project of the century. You know, what's life's going to be now, hard. That, that these decision-making, policy-making, these are going to be consequential for decades to come. Yes, that's right. And we will see lots of, lots of very human behavior, and we're going to get things wrong. But we also will learn what not to do, right? <laughs> well, I, I, from, from from your lips to God's ears is the old saying. 
is that uh, that uh, we will learn from this. Well, that's a good place to stop, Simon. I think that that's a good summary and and uh, uh, one that I think rings true to me anyway. That uh, we've got to grow up here in terms of some of these uh, uh, misallocated resources and hmm. m and malinvestment. Um, it's on all fronts, though. It's an and a social contract's the center of all of it. But our energy, our raw materials, our manufacturing, the nature of money, how we talk to each other, the relationship with our environment. All of it is on the table now. And we it's a social purification point where we either break through and grow up or break down. And then the, you have the natural way of the, the, the planetary systems of dealing with these sorts of things. And that's the Malthusians are right. Mm. Well, again, a good place to stop. Uh, my guest again has been Simon Michaud. Uh, Michaud um, SimonMichaud.com is where you can find all of his work. Simon, thanks a million for being on the Power, Hang Power Hungry podcast. I greatly enjoyed it. You're welcome, mate. And thanks to all of you in podcast land. Tune in for the next episode of the Power Hungry podcast. Until then, see ya.